Good evening, everyone. My name is Becky and I work at Waterloo Public Library. And I'm very excited to get to introduce our special guest lecture this evening. So this evening, we have um, Nowhere to Call Home with author and photography photographer, Leah Dembach. And uh, it's gonna be a great evening of some very informative information. So just quickly before I introduce uh, Leah, uh, I just wanted to mention that this past week, Waterloo Public Library has been running a virtual art gallery with Leah uh, on Facebook and on Instagram. You can go back and see any of the posts that we've had, um, but if you would like to see more uh, of Leah's work, which is um, stunning and beautiful and haunting, um, you can check her out at humanizingthehomeless.ca. That's her website. Uh, and you can find out more information about Leah and the work that she does um, with people experiencing homelessness. You can also follow Leah on Instagram to see more of her photography and uh, the stories that go along with those photos at humanizing underscore the underscore homeless. You can also check out Leah on Facebook uh, at humanizing the homeless official. And you can see again, lots of stories and photos uh, and hear about um, the work that she's doing and also just get to know some people uh, better and what they're experiencing and what they're going through. At the end of the lecture, we are going to have a question and answer period. So if you would like to ask Leah a question, uh, you can type that into the comments section on either Facebook or YouTube. And at the end, uh, Leah will address them and talk about them and hopefully answer uh, all of the questions that you might have for her. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Leah and I'm going to let her start her amazing lecture um, this evening. So. In this presentation, the award-winning photographer, author, and homeless advocate, Leah Dembach, will show the photographs and share the stories of some of the people experiencing homelessness whom she has met over the five years while traveling to major cities throughout the world, such as Washington, New York, Brisbane, and Toronto. Without any further ado, here's Leah Dembach. My mom used to take me around. Larry, who was a Mohawk Indian, told my dad and I, as I took his photo across the road from the Hamilton Salvation Army Booth Center. She died now, and ever since she died, I've been on the street. As he told us this, he broke down into tears. When I first came to the city, I was a uh, working as a bricklayer, but then I got hurt. I haven't been able to work for a year and a half now. Mom used to bring me here and I'd go, mom, I don't need to go here. I've got food to eat. And she'd, she'd say, someday son, you might not. And I want you to be safe when I'm gone. So she took me here, showed me this place, showed me the soup shop, showed me all the places I could get something to eat. And I've never been so desperate since she's been gone in my whole life. I raised my five kids and I don't know what happened. They just grew up and I ended up down here. Through a veil of tears, Larry went on to tell us his father died when he was only eight years old. Mom had a breakdown and couldn't handle us, so she called for child's aid to come get us. I remember looking out the back window crying, watching her get smaller and smaller. She used to keep me under her wing. She apologized. Uh, her dying words were, Larry, I'm sorry I didn't teach you what the world was about. I was kidnapped for six years. Trina, not her real name, told my dad and I, as I photographed her on the corner of Queen Street East and Victoria Street in Toronto. Oh yeah, it was on the news, she said. I've been raped and beaten on the street. I've been stabbed a million times. The cops don't care. The cops will just watch you get beaten. They don't care for us. A lot of poor people get beaten all the time 
and the cops will just stand there and laugh. At this, Trina started to cry. Sorry, it's a touchy subject, she said. I was raped by cops when I was 15, so I know what it's like. They, they, don't, they don't care about us. They'll beat you all the time. And if you don't have drugs, they'll just take your money. Down here, they think you're no good or nothing. You know, Trina continued, I didn't have parents. I raised myself. A lady took me in and tried to get me to go to school, but it was too late after being raped, beaten, tortured, and given drugs. I didn't have a choice, you know. Good afternoon. My name is Leah Denbach, and for the past four years, or five years now, I have been photographing people experiencing homelessness much like these individuals. Precisely throughout my book series, Nordic All Home, Photographs and Stories of People Experiencing Homelessness, I'm trying to humanize this often forgotten segment of society and shine a spotlight on the problem of homelessness. However, since there was, if there is one message that I really wanna drive across in my talk, it is this. If you don't know them, don't judge them. After all, is it wise to draw a conclusion, especially an important one, without first knowing the facts? And of course not. But this is precisely what we're doing with people experiencing homelessness. We don't know their stories. We don't know the facts about them. But yet, we judge them. And we look at them and think that they are lazy, that they have chosen to be on the street. But could we say that Larry is lazy or that Trina chose to be on the street? And who are we to judge these people? I think it is important for us to see that these myths about people experiencing homelessness only serve to stigmatize a group that has already been marginalized. I believe that people like Larry and Trina need not our judgment, but our compassion. At this time, I want to show you a five minute music video that I think powerfully destroys myths about people experiencing homelessness, that they choose to be on the street or that they are lazy. This music video is entitled, Who Cares? And it contains 70 of my photographs. It's sung by this German singer, Fred Foster Jr. And it features guitarist Gene Black, who played for Joe Cocker. And the song is written by Mary Applegate, who wrote the Power of Love, one of Celine Dion's biggest hits. So here's the video. Down in Georgia, 
with that word you're gambling on the road. It seems my child days, they just carry on. No, no, we did not see the sun. No, no, that life I cannot stay. Throughout my talk this afternoon, you will notice that I frequently made mention of my father, Tim. And that is because my project is really a partnership between the two of us. Together, we go out on the streets looking for people to photograph and interview. While I take the person's photograph, my father will interview them and ask them questions. And then after the photo show, we work together on picking the photographs and writing the stories for the book. My mother, Sarah, also had a big part in influencing me to begin photographing people experiencing homelessness. At the age of three, she was found wandering the crowded, dirty streets of Calcutta, India by a police officer. He brought her to Mother Teresa's orphanage where she was raised until the age of five when she was adopted by a family in Stainer, Ontario. She kept contact with Mother Teresa throughout her life, exchanging letters and went back to visit with her. So Mother Teresa, always had a large influence upon my life and upon me beginning to photograph people experiencing homelessness, though more on a subconscious level. Needless to say though, if it wasn't for the constant support of both of my parents, I wouldn't be doing the project. Having photographed hundreds of people experiencing homelessness over the past several years, I have come to see firsthand the harmful effects that our negative judgments can have on these people. For example, when I was chatting with a man named Stephen outside of a bank in Collingwood, 
One of the bank's managers stormed towards us, barking, as Stephen put it, like a chihuahua. She had evidently been told that someone had open alcohol around the bank and just wrongfully assumed that it would have been Stephen. Stephen also told me that recently when he was panhandling, someone walked up to him and said, well, you look well fed. Despite being very offended by the gall of the person, Stephen said he bit his tongue. However, indignant as he recounted the incident, he said, I wanted to say, you son of a blank, I could have been 400 pounds yesterday. You don't know. Sadly, I learned that shortly after I took Stephen's photograph, he was beaten up on the street and died shortly after. When my dad and I came across Becky, she was in a bad way. She was sprawled out on the sidewalk, merely a couple of meters from a very busy road. Since we were very concerned for her safety, my dad and I had no qualms about walking up and waking her up. She also looked as though she could very badly use the $10 in which I pay all of the people experiencing homelessness who model for me. Although she agreed to have her photograph taken, she didn't say very much. Most of her responses were of a yes or no variety. However, she did say that she lived in Peterborough before she moved to Toronto for 40 years. She said she stays in shelters in the cold weather and that she has no family. When it was time to say goodbye, I said it was nice to meet you and she said, it was really nice to meet you too. After I posted Becky's photograph on my Instagram account, humanizing the homeless, I received several messages from people that knew Becky before she was homeless. One woman, Amanda said, I just want to thank you for being so nice to Becky. I am adopted and Becky is my birth mother. Another woman, Barb, commented, Becky was a childhood friend and a wonderful person. This is what happens when mental illness and life beats you down over decades. You are loved, Becky. And this message from Jennifer. Thank you for sharing. Becky is the sister of my longtime friend of 30 years, Jean. Incredible. We never knew what happened to her since she disowned her family and moved to the big city. I hope she keeps well. And lastly, Nikki, I am a friend of Dave. Dave is the sister of Becky. This is amazing. We never knew what happened to her. And we've always been trying to get in touch. I was wondering if you have any information regarding her whereabouts, if you could please, please, please send it to me. Sadly, we learned that shortly after I took Becky's photograph, she was struck and killed by a car. I would now like to give you an update about an old story. Some of you might recognize this photograph because it's on the cover of my first book, Know What to Call Home, Volume 1. Throngs of people streamed noisily past. As my dad and I stood at the corner of Young and Dundas in Toronto, by the Eaton Centre, Canada's busiest mall, Though it was spring, it was still quite chilly. Through a gap in the crowd, my father and I spotted Lucy, about 25 meters away. She was bending over, retrieving something out of a bag. Dressed in very old and dirty clothes, she looked like a very forlorn and sad figure. My dad approached her, introducing the two of us. Hello, my name is Tim, and this is my daughter, Leah. Would she be able to take your photograph and we ask you a few questions? Would you be able to take my boyfriend Riley's photo too? Once we said yes, Lucy ran north along Young Street and returned about 10 minutes later with Riley in tow. When my dad 
and I began. Lucy seated herself on a ledge on the north wall of the Eaton Center where there's a lit up white wall that serves as a perfect white backdrop. I set up my camera equipment and began taking photographs. Lucy began by telling us that she once had big dreams. I've always been a writer, like journaling and short stories and whatnot. She told my dad and I. But it's always, and now it's hard to keep up with the stuff that you love because it's just survival on the streets. Lucy told us that she is an opioid addict. I've been an opioid addict since I was 14, she said. But it's always been manageable. I had a job. I was going to school. I had interests. However, one day, Lucy reached the point where her opioid addiction took over her life. She found herself with no job, no schooling, and no place to call home. Though my dad and I have met several people experiencing homelessness that have told us that they have been able to adapt with sleeping outside, Lucy is not one of them. I've had a hard time sleeping outside and stuff like that, Lucy told us, as her eyes closed repeatedly as, I tried, as we interviewed her. Lucy told us excitedly that she's soon going to be moving into transitional housing. I'm moving in like three days. So I'll get my own bathroom and bedroom and I'll share a kitchen. Sadly, this was not the case for when a couple months later, my father and I returned back to the Eaton Center. We saw Lucy and Riley sleeping on a broken cardboard box in the middle of the sidewalk. At one point during my photo shoot with another individual, I saw Lucy get up and look around. Although only in her early 20s, she looked like she was in her 80s. How was she ever going to make it through the winter, my dad said to me. The following spring, my father and I tried to keep an eye out for Lucy, especially because my first book had just come out and Lucy was on the cover. We wanted to give her a copy. However, despite the fact we returned multiple times to the Eaton Center, Lucy was nowhere to be found. I hope Lucy made it through the winter, my father said to me after a futile search for her. But then in the summer of 2018, much to our relief, we ran across Lucy and Riley washing car windows at the corner of Young and Dundas once again. I gave her a copy of the book and she was absolutely jubilant. She was jumping up and down yelling, woohoo. It was really nice to be able to bring this little bit of happiness to a woman's life who had seen so much misery. Several months later, the seasons began to change and we encountered Lucy beside the Eden Center. Once again, we were pleasantly surprised to see that she was well-dressed this time and she told us that she had finally gotten off the street and began staying at a women's shelter and that Riley too had somewhere to stay. When we were saying goodbye to her, she turned and said, this is a really good thing you are doing. In the winter of 2018, my dad and I came across Riley once again. However, this time he was alone. We could immediately tell from his expression that something was wrong. Lucy's in the hospital, he told us, with tears welling up in his eyes. She's not doing well. Before we said goodbye, Riley said something that I will never forget. Thank you so much for putting Lucy on the cover of your book. It made her feel human. And in the April of 2019, a producer with a major media outlet expressed interest in doing a story about the cover photo of Lucy and how it affected her life. However, first we had to find her. We spent about a month looking for her without any success. And a question kept forcing itself into our mind. Was Lucy still alive? While doing a photo shoot with another young woman named Diamond outside of a safe injection site in Toronto, she told us that she was friends with Lucy 
and would pass on our information. The very next day, when my dad returned home from work, there was a message on the answering machine from Lucy. She told us that she was doing very well, that her and Riley were sharing an apartment together. She told us that she had managed to get help with her drug problem, to even get it under control, and she had even began writing again. When my dad told Lucy about the possible news story, she was positively ecstatic. Later that day, my dad received an email from Riley saying, I can't begin to thank you enough. Partly because your book exists and you chose to put Lucy on the cover is the reason that we are both alive today. At the time when you took Lucy's photograph, we had both given up on life, but now we have both chosen to live. We no longer smoke crack cocaine, which was very difficult to say the least. Lucy is now a healthy weight and happier than I've seen her in a long time. And I definitely know that I am. We are both well on our way in being healthy in both mind, body, and soul. Albert Schweitzer, a theologian, physician, and humanitarian once said, I have always held firmly to the thought that each one of us can do a little bit to a bring some portion of misery to an end. And I agree wholeheartedly. Let me just suggest to you three things that we can do, we can all do to help people experiencing homelessness. Firstly, we can treat people experiencing homelessness with respect. To quote Mother Teresa, we have the wrong idea that only hunger that, sorry, we have the wrong idea that only hunger for bread is hunger. There is a much greater hunger and a much more painful hunger, a hunger for love, the feeling of being wanted, the feeling of being somebody to somebody, a feeling of being unwanted, unloved, and rejected. I think that is a very great hunger and a very great poverty. A couple of years ago when I was doing a photo shoot with a woman named Catherine, she grabbed my dad's hand in both of hers and said, thank you so much for doing this. Most people just ignore me. And recently when I showed one of my books to a staff member at the Hamilton Salvation Army Booth Center, he said to my dad and I, days will go by where nobody talks to these people. Nobody looks at these people, but you talk to them, you look at them, and you are giving them dignity. This is something that we can all do. When you next see a person experiencing homelessness, crouch down, look into their eyes and say, hello, how are you doing today? Shake their hands. I think you'd be really surprised how much they appreciate these small gestures. Secondly, we can financially support organizations that help people experiencing homelessness. These organizations have the know-how and the resources to best help these people and are often cash-strapped and could really use our financial support. Incidentally, I donate 100% of the profits for both my books and my exhibits to both people to, to homeless shelters. And if you're interested in supporting any of these organizations. I have lists of the organizations that I know and trust at the back of all my books. And third, we can pressure the government both nationally and provincially to build more affordable housing. David Giffen, the executive director of the Coalition of the Homeless in New York City says, the vast majority of people experiencing homelessness are there simply because of lack of affordable housing. It is exceedingly rare for people to choose to be on the streets unless they have no other options. In nearly 30 years of my involvement with people experiencing homelessness, I have yet to meet anyone who would choose to turn their back on an affordable place to live. We must always work hard to dispel the myth that people are homeless by choice. 
when in fact no choice exists. And I want to close with the following words from one of my heroes, Nelson Mandela. It is in your hands to create a better world for all who live in it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leah, for joining us tonight. Um, I just want to mention to everyone, if you maybe came in late uh, or you would like to share uh, tonight's lecture with anyone, because it is an incredibly important uh, lecture and really, really important information um, that uh, this live stream will be available as a video uh, 24 hours after it ends. So you can view it on YouTube and Facebook later on if you'd like to share it or if you would like to watch it again or if you missed any parts of it. So now we're gonna give you a chance if you have any questions for Leah, now is the time to type them into your comments section uh, and we're gonna do a Q and A with Leah. Um, while you guys do that, if you have a question, like I said, please type it in. Um, and I think I will start by maybe asking a couple of questions, Leah, if that's okay. Mm -hmm, for sure. All right, so let's get, what I'm curious about is, um, when we were getting ready for this, I did ask, and you have been going out and photographing during the pandemic, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So I guess it's kind of a multi questions here, but what's that been like and, and what are you seeing and, and how are people experiencing homelessness dealing with this? Because everyone is struggling right now and I can only imagine when you are already, like have a struggle and then to put another struggle on top of that, I can't even imagine. So what have you been seeing and what have you been hearing um, from people during this time when you've been going out? Um, no, I mean, yeah, I exactly feel the same way. Um, so just when the pandemic had hit, uh, I was really thinking about people experiencing homelessness, but I never began to realize really how bad it would be for them. Um, and I read an article and it really highlighted how the pandemic was affecting these people. And it really hit my dad and I because we, we realized that um, most people don't realize um, what the pandemic is doing to these individuals. So then we decided um, to go out and start photographing them and, and getting firsthand uh, their encounters of how the pandemic was affecting them. And um, just some of the things that I was surprised about um, in the article where we don't think about the fact that there was no one on the street uh, for several months and most of these people only income is panhandling so they had absolutely no income for any money whatsoever so no way of getting any food, any clothes, personal hygiene. Uh, places like Tim Hortons and libraries and stuff like that also closed and not allowing these people to come in, use the washroom, wash up a little bit, uh, or, or public locations like the YMCA that have showers, any opportunity like this. Um, so they had no options for any hygiene whatsoever. Um, we couldn't wash our hands, but they couldn't even have a shower or use the bathroom. Um, I've been to Toronto even recently, there's nowhere to use the washroom. Um, so I can't even imagine how hard it would be for these people for months and months having no bathroom at all. Um, and also a lot of services for these individuals that they have really been relying on uh, were shut down due to the pandemic, um, just due to safety and stuff like that. So a lot of these people that, for example, were relying on addiction services or drugs that were assisting them with their getting over addictions, uh, those services were no longer being provided. So there was a lot of people relapsing on addiction and a lot of people having to use drugs in locations that were not safe uh, because you're no longer allowed to congregate outside of a safe injection site. Um, and just one woman that I interviewed told me she had to go use drugs in an alleyway. And, and then she said she's on drugs in an alleyway and she's very scared about being raped or taken advantage of or kidnapped because she's on the influence, um, not around her friends where she would usually be if she was allowed to be outside of a safe injection site um, for the pandemic. And these are just things that I would never think of. So I was, was really shocked and I just, my father and I decided we needed to go out and photograph these people. And 
we heard firsthand that all those things were very true and really affecting these individuals uh, and that their lives that are already miserable and horrible have become absolutely unbearable. Um, and it's it's still this way to the to this day. Uh, we've even gone recently. Hasn't gone any better. Um, these like tent cities out there still have no bathrooms, no sanitation, uh, and anything. Uh, it's really horrible to see. So yeah, <laughs> I hope yeah. that sort of answers your question. No, that's yeah because and like you said, things that we we take for granted that we wouldn't think about because I mean the the bathroom thing I I thought about and. One of the major things when we had to close the library, we do we do have people experiencing homelessness that use the library as a safe hub, a place that they can come and access internet and be warm or cool, depending on, you know, we had some really hot, we've had a really hot summer. Um, and so having those places shut down, you know, that would typically be a cooling center for someone. Um, I definitely thought of that, but you're right. What I didn't, never even occurred to me is, yeah, no one's on the streets. So, you know, where you know, where are you getting help from? Where are you, you know, making you know, any money to buy just some food for the day, right? I, I, yeah, and then Toronto especially has been so hard hit and they were in even sort of a stronger lockdown than Kitchener-Waterloo that, yeah, how do you, you know, how do you survive when you have access to nothing, basically? Literally yeah, nothing. Exactly. I'm surprised that really anybody is surviving. Uh, during these times yeah yeah and and that was that's the biggest thing right when you're already struggling and then you add that extra layer on top of it you know it's I, I can't even I can't even imagine mm -hmm. um, looks like there is a comment coming in okay so here's a question from Nicholas Leah uh, Oh, so Nicholas, uh, Nick, uh, it is remarkable in our connected world that people are dif difficult to track down. It must be so rewarding to find people and for them to be found. How do these reunions feel? Uh, yeah, it is definitely really rewarding. Uh, other than the story that I talked about with Lucy and Riley, uh, we've run into probably about 20 people experiencing homelessness that I photographed after I photographed them. So we were sort of able to show them the photograph or if the book had come out, give them the book that they were in and catch up with them since we know their name and we know sort of their story. Uh, so it's always really rewarding. Uh, also to see how they're doing. Uh, some of them were doing better. Uh, however, most of them are often doing worse, which is unfortunate. Um, and in one case, other than Lucy and Riley, uh, someone was housed. So that was really nice to see. Um, but in most cases, like I said, um, although it is really rewarding to see the person, they, their condition is often de degrading, um, unfortunately. Uh, but it, it is rewarding, uh, especially when we can show them the photograph and they're they're so excited and uh, ecstatic and, or we can give them the book and they're usually even more excited because they see themselves in the book and uh, they often thank us uh, for what I'm, what we're doing and, and stuff like that. So that's also really rewarding. Yeah. And I think what you said too, um, you know, your whole mandate is trying to humanize someone and, and yeah, to see yourself, in a book that alone must be a spark for for people mm -hmm. um while we just wait to see if any more questions come in uh i had been running it throughout the your lecture but i thought we would um maybe bring some attention to it uh so leah do you just want to talk about the current fundraiser that you have going for one roof youth services and ywkw I actually don't know that much about it. So it had you have some prints. Um, oh, okay, I'm tail, so right? sorry. I got that's mixed okay. <laughs> you have you're yeah. a very busy I've never lady heard of, like in this context. 
Yeah, the like the gallery thing with yeah. the photos for sale. Yeah. Um, yeah, so on this link, uh, we do have 12 portraits of people experiencing homelessness. And this was an exhibit at the Kitchener City Hall that was taking place um but then COVID hit and no one really got to ever experience the exhibit or see the photographs and read the stories uh, from the exhibit so we made a online sort of exhibit that you can visit uh via this link and all the photographs are also for sale uh well all my photographs are for sale but these ones are for sale for this exhibit and all the 100% of the prof profits from the canvases will be going back to uh, different homeless shelters. Um, I think this one oh, is going to be going to the local One Roof Youth Services. So to support this youth services, it would be really nice if people check out the exhibit. You can read through the stories and, of course, let me know what you think after. Yeah, and I I went to your opening night for that exhibit, and then it was like, what, like three days later or four days later that everything started shutting down. So, and then mm -hmm. your exhibit was your your photo, like your actual physical photographs, the canvases that were up were quarantined for months, weren't they? I believe so. I haven't yeah. seen them since. So. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they're just stuck in city hall with no one to with no one around to look at them, which is. I mean, maybe a, a bit of a metaphor, but um, but yeah, so that's wonderful. So anyone that's watching, you can feel free to go to that link that is um, up on the screen right now, and you can um, do that until midnight. Send in some questions. <laughs> yeah, there's, I mean, I can keep asking questions, but <laughs> how were people experiencing um, homelessness finding I mean, were they able to find masks and like safety, like safety equipment? I can't. I can imagine that that would also be mm -hmm. a, like a nightmare for them. That's not something um, I know too much specifically about. Uh, however, we did run into uh, maybe about five people experiencing homelessness that did have masks and i believe that they had been getting them um from like homeless shelter or other uh homeless services that are still open possibly addiction uh no sorry um an injection sites and stuff like that um however there are a huge portion of people experiencing homelessness that we interviewed they didn't really know anything about the pandemic other than like oh this corona thing that's happening like that's about it like they didn't know how severe it was what precautions they should be taking that they should even be wearing a mask they really knew nothing because they don't have access to the internet to the news yeah. so all they know is there's a corona thing going on and people are wearing masks and that's about it so yeah unfortunately due to just no education because these people have no access to things to educate themselves about the pandemic. A lot of them just don't even know that they should be looking for that type of thing or to be taking those precautions. Yeah. All right. I think let's throw up your website one more time. Uh, so if you'd like to, to learn more about Leah and her work, you can go to humanizingthehomeless.ca. Um, Leah, you have photographs there and stories and more information about or um, organizations that people can support, um, I would assume, correct? Yes, I have, um, I have lots of uh, resources on the website uh, about my project. Um, so there's lots of photos and stories on there if you wanna see uh, photos and stories from the different countries I've been to um, and from the beginning to the end of my project. Uh, I also have uh, photos and stuff of my exhibits, and I'll have information about up upcoming exhibits if you stay tuned. I, um, oh, what was the last thing I was going to say? Um, totally blanked. But. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, but Been that there. is that's definitely a great resource uh, just in terms of following all the work that I'm doing. Awesome. And I'm going to just throw up your uh, Instagram one more time. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say I have all my book information on the website. That's right. Yes. Um, um, so, yeah, if uh, if people want to purchase my books, uh, I have Nowhere to Call Home, the, uh, Nowhere to Call Home Photographs and Stories of People Experiencing Homelessness, Volume 1, 2, and 3 uh, that are all available. Uh, and if you go on the website, you can see the links and the different stores that they're available. Uh, just to name a few, it's like Amazon, Chapters, Barnes & Noble, all that kind of stuff. But the links are all on there. And, and then... Uh, I think if people want to shop local to Wordsworth Books carries them as well, correct? I think in Kitchener, I believe. I for, I don't think it's... I, I think, think it's... I don't, I don't know what it's called, but there is a place in Kitchener. Oh, Mill, Mill Pond Books. Mill Pond. Mill okay. Pond Record and Books in Cambridge. In Cambridge. They Wonderful. carry it, yeah. Um, um, and then 100% of the profits goes back to people experiencing homelessness, which is always something to keep in mind. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, I will also mention that, I will put this up as, uh, you can, you know, uh, the library has lots of different virtual programs going on, but at WPL.ca as well, um, we have the first two volumes of Leah's book. Um, we will be getting the third one eventually. We're supposed to get it. And then um, the pandemic hit, so things kind of got a little skewed, but we have the first two that you can place a hold uh, as well. Um, to, to look at it if you need to, to do it that way. So that's also an option as well. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna put this back up again. People um, have to have some last questions. I'm so <laughs> shocked. <laughs> Everyone's super quiet tonight. Um, I was most interested about your experience uh, going out and, and photographing during the pandemic. And I, I think everything you said was incredibly fascinating and, and a good reminder to us of you know, small things that we take for granted every day that not everyone has. So, um, mm, most definitely. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, just to like, touch on that again, um, my dad and I decided since the pandemic has just been such a huge event in the lives of these individuals, we've decided to um, make volume four of my book uh, ha about the pandemic. So uh, I'm going to have photographs from, of course, before the pandemic and after if that comes. But um, it's going to be uh, largely about half about the pandemic. I'm going to have a lot of stories um, that I took got during the pandemic and related to the pandemic. Um, so people, it's good for people to keep an eye out in the, in the next year or so when volume four comes out. It, um, you can read all these pandemic related stories yeah and uh and you have been posting stories i know we again i'll just let people know that we did um we're very grateful to you that you shared some of your photographs with us and we did a virtual art gallery over the past uh week since you know art galleries haven't been open so uh it was nice to do that virtual art gallery and i know that you had some images in there um from just the past couple of months Mm -hmm. um, that you had taken and those stories. So if anyone is interested, um, they can check out your feed and they can also check out Waterloo Public Library's Instagram and Facebook to see those as well um, and, and learn a yeah. little bit more. Yeah, good collection, like all the ones at the top on Instagram and uh, those ones are all uh, current. And yeah. I just posted one today, actually. Check that one out. And uh, they're all um, since the pandemic started. That's great. Uh, okay, Leah, I thank you so much again for joining us and uh, taking the time to share this information. Um, again, it's invaluable and so important, and I hope people will share this with others. Uh, thank you so much, and um, I'm gonna we're gonna call it a night. Awesome, thank you, Leah. Thank you so much. Have a good night. <laughs> Bye.